and then correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. But I think with six, we might we might be able to start. Yeah. Six is a quorum. All right. Wonderful. Then I will call the meeting to order. Um, and Sarah or Jessica, whoever takes the attendance, the role. Okay. Jessica, do you want to do that? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to start with the people I see at the top of my screen coming around. Uh, Archna Sood? Yes. Okay, Derek Ohanian? Uh, yes, hi. Thank you. Samantha Altabai? Here, thank you. Amanda Nicola? Here. Okay, uh, Council Member Reed? Here. Okay, and Council Member Burns? Here. Perfect. Wonderful. And first on the agenda, we need a motion to suspend the rules and meet virtually as we are not physically in person. Do I have a motion? Motion to suspend the rules. Thank you, Derek. And a second. 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 Perfect. And we'll take and this uh, a full vote on this, correct? Yes, please. So, uh, Archana Sood? Uh, yes. Okay, Derek Ahanian? Yes. Okay, Samantha Altsbry? Yes. Okay. Amanda Nagola? Yes. Thank you. Council Member Burns? Yes. And Council Member Reed? Yes. Thank you. All right, and then as we go through the agenda, uh, the first item I have uh, after the suspension of the rules is public comment. Do we have anybody from the public indicating that they would like to provide comment to the? We do have four uh, attendees. Um, would any of our four, if you would like to comment and you're an attendee, please virtually raise your hand. Okay. Yep. I think that we are all set. Um, and we didn't have any um, online. Correct. correct. Wonderful. Another thing we have to check for is like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Then uh, we'll go to our next agenda item, which is the adoption of the minutes from our last meeting. Um, does anybody, I guess I'll need a motion. Can you all still hear me? All right, sorry, I'm getting an alert for my computer that you cannot, um, but perfect. So uh, a motion to adopt the minutes or approve the minutes from last meeting. Um, do I have one? And Move approval of the minutes. Thank you. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Derek. And um, is there any discussion before we go for a vote? Any changes or uh, adjustments or edits to the minutes as you've seen? I do not have any. I'm seeing heads uh, shaking the negative. So we'll go towards uh, re uh, roll call. Thank you. Archana? Yes. Derek? Yes. Thank you. Samantha? Yes. Amanda? Yes. Um, Council Member Burns? Aye. Okay. And Council Member Reed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Our next item is the support service discussion. And I believe I turn the floor over to, to Jessica. Is that perfect? Yes, thank you. So after City Council approved uh, case management and safety net allocations on November 8th, that was wonderful. Um, staff has been busy with the compliance and then moving into agreements with agencies. Um, tonight, we do want to talk about next steps uh, on our around that third component of our restructured funding process, which is support services. Um, so there, I know that there was a lot of information in the memo, but basically staff is looking for direction from this committee um, and agreement. Uh, we do have a, a presentation. So we'd like to walk you through our, our logic and then get feedback from the committee. Um, do I have permission to share my screen and run that? 
run our slides? Okay, thank you. just to flip through, we have our agenda. Um, so we, we can start just by briefly, um, staff was in discussion with um, city staff working with uh, populations of need to identify community needs. Um, and this is just list those community needs briefly. Um, that happened in November 20th. So this was sort of right in the middle of COVID. Um, and staff met with Health and Human Services, Youth and Young Adult Victim Advocates, uh, Police Department, and our fire, uh, and of course our ombudsman. Um, the social services that agencies identified through applications, so this took place in May and June of 2021. Um, and again, this is information from applications only, but the highest needs were around job training, um, parenting supports, legal services, and childcare. So our goal really was to find overlap. Staff also held uh, two sort of town hall meetings, uh, open forums with service providers in the area. So not just service providers that the city of Evanston funds, um, but there were 18 agencies represented um, to look at, to really rank the um, most needed support services, which turns out to be individual and group counseling, job training and workforce development, um, but also to rank the barriers and to see what we can do to alleviate those barriers. Um, so here we've got the support services ranked 50 agencies, 50% 50 of the agency representatives identified individual and group counseling as the top. Uh, 33 identified job training and workforce development, and 17 identified primary care. Um, I'm sorry, let me go back. So for um, individual and group counseling, really around those mental health services, uh, let me just point out that the top referral referring partners uh, were Turning Point, Trilogy, Thresholds, YOU, uh, and the Family Institute at Northwestern University. Um, top partnering agencies around workforce development included the Youth Job Center, Kurtz Cafe, Evanston Rebuilding Warehouse, and Oakton Community College. Um, and everyone identified Erie uh, as our, our primary partner for, for our, our main partner for primary care. All right. So our, our biggest barriers. Um, are, are you know, people not having the financial resources to pay or they don't have insurance. Um, providers having limited capacity uh, for people who aren't insured or people who are on Medicaid. Um, or that capacity has been reached based on current staff. So, um, so this is where we pause and talk about, you know, because this is the first year of our new um, funding cycle, uh, what we can do um, or, or whether this committee, um, what this committee would like to do uh, in terms of, of providing support services. And if this committee agrees with um, the idea of supporting or at least reviewing um, individual and group counseling, job training and workforce development, and or primary care. So I can, let me pause here. Oh, hi, Tamina, welcome. Hello. Oh, oh hey. Here. And, and Welcome, Danita. Yep, I can either go through the rest of the slides uh, around the rest of the information provided in the memo, or we can we can open it up for discussion at this point. At the 
it's at the chair's <laughs> preference. Yeah. Um, why don't we open up for discussion and then we can uh, continue that way we don't get too far down and people forget their questions. Mm -hmm. um, so first, um, any any members um, have any questions? I know I have a couple. I will kick off with mine then. Um, on the uh, the fee for service funding for both uh, individual and group therapy, and then for primary care, one thing um, that I had an, a question about, but also sort of um, I would like clarity is uh, Medicaid law requires that Medicaid always be the payer of last resort, and so if there's a potential other payer we could actually be complicating the revenue streams for these providers um, if there's even a component potentially of uh, payment um, out there. Uh, so has that that pro that been considered and sort of the implications of, of the rules, the financial regulations around Medicaid, given that these are Medicaid covered services as well for our Medicaid eligible? Um, no, um, <laughs> not that way. Um, in fact, that is something um, I know that they were, you know, obviously we know they're a pair of last resort, um, but um, not maybe the way it should be anyway, because it hadn't occurred to us if we started payment that this could preclude somebody's eligibility. Now, there are people who are not yet on Medicaid. And um, so that was something we talked a lot about. And one of the things was there, I believe there can be a situation where people who be, are accepted as eligible for Medicaid can also have their um, coverage go back to when somebody started, if they started earlier, but not, I'm not clear on whether or not that means that would disqualify them. Yeah, so I can walk through a little bit about how this works very high level. Uh -huh. um, you are, let's just put aside the public health emergency because it has changed eligibility requirements yep. significantly, um, but you are, you are correct that there can be some retroactivity. So first and foremost, eligibility always goes back to the date of application. So if you apply on November 1st, it takes them nine, you know, 90 days to approve your eligibility. It goes back to when you submitted it. However, there are also time periods where you can go back prior to submission of application. I believe it's 90 days um, prior to application. And that is oftentimes, um, think of it sort of worst case scenario, somebody's in a car accident or, or whatnot, they need to get care right away, then they submit their, then the hospital or the other provider submits their application, they can go back retroactively um, for a period of time. So mm -hmm. I, I believe that's 90 days prior to the application being submitted. Um, again, separate and apart from public health emergency eligibility um, changes. The, the piece around payment and Medicaid being the payer of last resort never impacts the Medicaid member themselves. They don't ever, you know, lose eligibility. They have full coverage. What, where this would become complicated is actually for the provider or the agency that we're trying to offer support to. Mm -hmm. um, and why this is, I think, unique is that it would be under a fee-for-service structure. So if it were just a grant or, um, and it wasn't tied to individual specifically in the individual care that they're providing, then it is a grant that is supporting access and, um, you know, bro access broadly speaking. But when you start talking about a fee-for-service system, you're act they're submitting something, some kind of claim, and there's some kind of payment for those services rendered to those Medicaid eligible. And so that's where I think because of the shift in system, we could be complicating it for those providers, do I think the state would necessarily go in and, and track all of this? Probably not. But if they were to ever be audited, they would, they would pose, um, they would be putting themselves in jeopardy. And if Evanston's not going to pay at least the Medicaid fee-for-service rates, mm -hmm. then we're making it 
almost administratively a complete nightmare. Um, so I just didn't know if we obviously for non non Medicaid eligible members or for mem for services that aren't covered by Medicaid. Right. This isn't an issue. It's just right. those Medicaid eligible members, Medicaid covered services, Medicaid enrolled providers of which the ones you just listed, they, they're all Medicaid enrolled providers. Uh, yeah, I would expect they all yeah. are. Yeah. One of the things, let me ask you if, if we can do this, because we know there are situations where one of the things we've talked about is it's really hard to also from a cash management and a payment plan system, um, our sort of expectation is we would have agreements with providers where it is a quote fee for service, but we would give a grant and then they'd sort of calculate against it like when they had used that up, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, does that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's probably a way to structure that where it's um, maybe staff hours as opposed to individuals served. It could be um, something like that, maybe. But but I mean, because one of the things that we figured would not work, and when we haven't gotten into discussions with, so this is really helpful uh, in detail, is we don't want if they're already strapped for getting payments, which they sometimes are, when they're accepting Medicaid, we wanted to try to make it, it's like easier for them to take the Medicaid clients and start mm -hmm. getting compensation for it. Because one of the things was like, well, would we then expect to be, if they, if they could, if any of it was eligible under Medicaid and could it be put back, would they have to re reimburse? And I would say no. I mean, the whole point of what we're doing is trying to get people into services rapidly. And we're expecting that many of them will be come Medicaid or whatever. But that that upfront barrier is what we're trying to deal with. So that was our purpose in trying to do this. And so I think that um, if there is some way such as ours served um, would we be able to tie it to specific referrals then would be my question because that's what we really want to tie it to. You know, we're trying to. Referrals to the service or for the individual? For the, so, so a case management agency is referring a client. So we just want the hours to be calculated for the referred clients. In other words, the payment would be calculated for those refer for clients. I think, I think you could structure it that way. I'm also, as you were talking, Sarah thought, you know, if you structure it for, um, you know, sir costs, not reimbursed under Medicaid or yes. um, not then, and you structure it that way. Yes. Um, I think you avoid that challenge for those providers as well. And, and we could certainly do that, but would that get them into services rapidly is the question. And I just, you know, well, what I would say is you could, depending on how you structure it, you could say for Medicaid and even, you know, for services that aren't reimbursed by the Medicaid agency. So even if it's a Medicaid eligible member, it, you're not necessarily, getting, yeah, there would be a financial incentive. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councilman Burns. Cost that last one just just threw me off. I thought I was following it. that last thing just threw me off. So cost not reimbursed under Medicaid, but I thought you said earlier that non Medicaid eligible services wouldn't be an issue in what you brought up. So how I'm trying to bring yeah those in the line yeah. So there could potentially be circumstances where um, agency A provides a service to a Medicaid member. Um, that Medicaid member you know becomes enrolled you know, six months after the application is submitted because there's a, a backlog in processing. Um, but because of that issue, yes, that agency A provided eventually to a Medicaid member a uh, Medicaid eligible service. Um, but it's six months later that the the likelihood that they're going to submit a claim to, a, to the Medicaid agency for that service rendered six months prior is probably pretty low. Um, and so 
that's probably a cost not covered under Medicaid. Could they go through the process and do it all? Absolutely. Are they going to? No, uh, most likely not. And that comes into sort of why there's a lag in putting new members into services is because there's a recognition by the agency that it's going to take so long for them to be reimbursed. Is that? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. that makes sense. Does, so does Medicaid cover the 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 individual and group counseling that this that our report today in the packet called attention to? Is that a Medicaid? Does Medicaid provide? Is that um, will we pay for that? Will Medicaid cover those services? Yes, okay. for medically necessary, appropriate, you know, you. It, it needs to obviously obviously be a member that would would need group counseling or individual counseling um but we're talking about eight and members that this is absolutely covered for and so people who wouldn't just high level be eligible for medicaid then because if if then it becomes uh, and i think the report also called attention to this it may it called attention to the fact that benefits enrollment was also an issue um unless the people that we're talking about just aren't eligible for, for whatever reason. So I'm just wondering high level, what are some of the common reasons why someone wouldn't be eligible for Medicaid? The, there's gonna be two most common. One is that they make over 138% of the federal poverty level. So they're you know, maybe somewhere between 138 and 200% of federal poverty level still, still um, you know, a struggle to make ends meet, um, may not be able to afford insurance, um, however, they don't qualify for Medicaid from a financial perspective. Also, um, individuals that do not meet uh, residency and citizenship uh, requirements under the Medicaid program. And the 138%, can we talk about like for our area, what is that in a, a monthly? Um, it's really low. <laughs> it, is, it is very low. Let me tell you what it is for a family of four. In I normally have these numbers memorized. I apologize. Okay. My experience is the federal poverty line is roughly equivalent to 30% of area median income. 30% mm. of area median income means you are hanging on by your fingernails in Evanston. Yes. So for individuals, so for one person, it is $12,880 for 2021. For a family of four, that is $26,500. Yeah, it's really low. It's low. So if, you're, if you're making over that, you, you, you're you not can't eligible. Go. Correct. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, I'm sorry. That is 100%. I already oh, know. Is that 138? Anyhow, it, it's very, yes. You're not eligible beyond that. That's okay. So, but we know that those are, so for one person is 12,880. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions I can, I can, uh, um, I apologize for clarification and for minutes, federal poverty line itself at 100, 138 is, um, is 17,774. Still okay, though, very, Still no, 17,000, what is it? Seven. 17,774. 774. And then what about for a family of four? I think was the other one we did. That would be, sorry, it gave me the, it gave me Hawaii first. <laughs> Always useful. Right. It is um, 36,570. And is this a chart you're looking at? Yes. Could you send this to us at some point? It would be helpful. Uh, yes. Sarah always sends me the AMI charts, which are helpful. So. <laughs> I'm going to have I will, all of this. Uh, I will send it over to that. Our chart points. that tried to match the, the area median income and poverty level up, and it was just yeah. like made people go crazy. <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, so I guess my but, last question is, is um, and I don't know if you know this from uh, some of the folks that you named, Trilogy and some of the others, is... Um, you know, yeah, how, how in terms of what we're dealing with in Evanston, is it is it people are not who need um, individual group counseling the most just earn over the, these amounts? Or, you know, I, I guess have we identified what the main issue is um, of people not being able to get get uh, access to individual group counseling? So that's a great question. I, I did hold these conversations with agencies, and I think it is that that sort of middle uh, 
individuals and households who are not Medicaid eligible, but also not making enough to afford the services. Sometimes people may have insurance, but it is just like catastrophic care almost. And, and, and that was one of the you know, things that I think you, it has affected some people's ability to get broader services that they may need. Is, is, is there ever a case where somebody restructured or their medical benefits that they could actually afford uh, counseling, but are concerned they couldn't, and that it would be expensive, and that if they had some type of counseling around their insurance program, that they could adjust, make adjustments to, you know, expand that coverage. You know, I don't know. I'm not in in the healthcare providing industry, but I'm just curious. Is I'm just trying to see if this is a um, um, do we need help with people enrolling in benefits, not just enrolling for even Medicaid, but you know, I, even enrolling for any type of benefit can be challenging. To, I mean, I did it for the city and it was like, you know, trying to figure it out was was uh, was challenging even for, for our household. So I just I'm trying to pinpoint is this do we need to invest money in helping people understand medical coverage, whether that's Medicaid or any other coverage in order to make sure that they get counseling and, and or is it something else? So but I'll I'll, uh, I'll stop there so other folks can get their questions. I, yeah, I will say, Councilman Burns, you're absolutely correct. And actually, the current state administration had a healthcare study, and the number one largest group of individuals who do not have health care are those who are eligible for Medicaid and aren't enrolled. Um, and, and it really is simply the, the process of navigating the system. And we saw a real increase in that uh, once the navigators that were funded under the Affordable Care Act at the federal level saw a decrease in funding. And so that is a, a challenge, I think, that... Um, you know, impacts quite a bit of the system. I think I saw Amanda's hand up before Demita's, but I apologize if that order is wrong. Um, no, no problem. I don't, I have a question, a couple of questions or thoughts, but I don't know who they're necessarily directed toward, but um, it sounds like there's two sort of issues because one is the funding folks who aren't Medicaid eligible, as we just discussed, but also the very long waiting list. And I wonder if it's possible for us also to try to recruit additional agencies that aren't Medicaid affiliated yet so that the pool of agencies is increased, you know, with this money that they could also then see more people because that's, that's another part of the, the problem is it's hard to get in. Um, in addition to not having the financial means to pay for it. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And I don't know if, you know, if there are other agencies or, um, you know, if we're talking about mental health, um, you know, other clinics, private practices, you know, what have you that we could recruit, given that we have this extra money to see so many people or so many sessions or what have you. No, I think that's a great point, Amanda. And then um, uh Naya also um, just indicated this in the chat that their uh, connections, they, they're seeing the same thing of just many providers not accepting Medicaid and, and from both from the member or the, the individual patient perspective, it's hard to get into Medicaid at times, but also from the provider perspective, there's a lot of barriers as well, um, especially as you indicated for smaller providers. Um, and so some assistance there um, to expand access could be um, something new, I think definitely to explore further. and. Uh, I can, uh, one of the things that we actually talked about initially in what we wanted to try to do, um, I don't know that we can take it on quite yet. I think we may have to start with sort of more basics and then work up to it. But we, we talked about that. Can people get into services and are there enough providers who take Medicaid? Um, and we also talked about one of the potential barriers which wasn't showing up in this, but we hear a lot about is um, uh, certain groups, especially people of color, frequently say they don't find providers that they are comfortable going to and that sort of thing. And I really do think those things have to be looked at. Um, I would, I think we need to take sort of baby steps <laughs> and try to see where we can get um, and maybe expand to that because I think it's very important it, but I just don't know that we have the bandwidth or the funding right now to take that on. 
you know, so I, I think that maybe if we could start by addressing certain barriers and then maybe move forward. But it is a very good question because I think that's a huge issue overall. And um, we may have, we may find we have to get to it very rapidly because we can't do it the other way too, so. Absolutely. Demita? Hi. Um, I can speak to a couple of things that's been mentioned. So I'm a mental health therapist that works for a private practice in Northbrook. And we do not take Medicaid or Medicare. Um, it's very difficult to get paneled with them, first of all. There's a lot of hoops that they want you to jump through. And then they don't even pay a lot <laughs> towards the service. Um, so that's one thing we'd love to, and we'd love to be able to take it, but it's, it's just a lot to be able to take Medicare. Um, and then the other situation that you just mentioned, Sarah, about uh, people of color not finding people um, like them or they feel comfortable with. Um, I am one of two Black therapist out of seven there, and I was the only one for two years until uh, four months ago when we hired someone else. And during the pandemic, my caseload doubled because then I did start getting more Black um, uh, patients who said that they only wanted to see. And that's um, and to get a male Black therapist is like finding a unicorn. So. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> different barriers that go on. Yeah. Well, we're going to be picking your brain more <laughs> in the future. <laughs> I am so glad you're on the committee. I mean, these are the things that we really need help and guidance on. And so I think we need to start talking more about it. And, and even as we try to figure out some short-term things, because I really, I really do think it's important that these are some of the biggest problems that are affecting people. So, um, Demita, real, real quick, because this is actually a, a, a thought I had as I was trying to um, reflect on what we've been asked to, to do today. Um, high level, can can you describe what what that caseload looks like? You know, on average for you. Um, so I have thirty patients on my caseload. And that's a, that's a lot, you know, full time for us usually should run around 20, maybe 18 to 20. But um, what saves me is that some of my clients don't see me every week. I have every other week or once a month, something like that. But that's, that's a pretty high caseload. And, and we and still how, have a waiting list. <laughs> how many uh, out of those 30 do you meet with? Uh, every week um at least 20. okay and and well that's 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 uh, and then um and then how many uh what is the standard in terms of of uh how many patients you should meet with how many hours you should spend working with patients a day is there a like a industry standard of you shouldn't go over this amount or how does how does that work in terms of daily um caseload so that's really left to us independent the, the you know usually the when we work for a private practice they leave uh, our hours up to us what what we can handle i mean there are times where i have um between five and seven clients back to back my monday through wednesday are my heavy days i i don't leave work till seven or eight um and then friday and sundays are a little lighter but again we pick our schedule i mean i try to make sure that I see people, enough people, and I try to give myself um, a little free time, but sometimes um, it's just not possible. And we get caught up sometimes because we say we want to help, you know, we don't want to keep turning people away. So then we pile on and then, you know, we may be a little bunker sometimes, <laughs> but I try to give myself an hour in between clients at least once, um, once a day. Sometimes it's possible and sometimes it's not. So not an hour between each client, but just one of those an hour, at least an hour a day between. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then how much, last question on this is, and how much is kind of the administrative side of things, the paperwork, or do you have 
administrator yeah. was there's other people that help with that. So that's the other side of that. And it depends on, again, what type of agency you work for. So, you know, I have to do notes. You know, I'm, I'm tasked with doing notes. I'm tasked with running folks down sometime when they're not paying their balance or their co-pays. Um, we're tasked with even checking in with some of our clients, other providers like their psychiatrists, if they're kids, you know, checking in with their social workers, regular doctors, like that type of thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. This is really helpful. Thank you, Dimitri. And Demita, did you have a sense of, because I, I recognize the Medicaid reimbursement is so much lower even than Medicare and Medicare is lower than the commercial reimbursement, but sort of what that gap is, um, either by percentage or sort of dollars or why, why there's that barrier um, from accepting Medicare and Medicaid? To be honest, I don't know why it's that much lower. Um, I mean, it, it'd be almost better off if we just did a sliding scale. And actually we do, that's the thing. So we do offer a program um, it's called, the place I work for is called Brighter Pathways. Um, we offer a pathways program, whereas we as individual therapists decide whether or not we want to take, it's like pro bono. So right now I have two clients who they only play, pay the practice $20, but I don't get anything for them because um, one was a student, a college student, and the other one just didn't have it. And I just said, okay, I'll do it. But yeah. But the, the obviously very limited capacity of, of how you could take on um, patients in that in that manner. And and I would also think that if you, potentially Medicaid members um, reimbursements lower, but also the need um, in terms of the amount of work that you as a therapist have to do with these members, probably more trauma, um, yeah. you know, more challenges with these members, um, it, it becomes Capacity is just limited. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your perspective. That was, in, it's incredibly mm -hmm. helpful. You're welcome. Other qu questions or, or discussion? All right. Then, Jessica, I'll turn it back over to you to continue through, or, or was that sort of the perfect? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen here. Okay, so in addition to individual and group counseling, um, the other needs are job job training and workforce development in primary care. So, so the committee can kind of think about how we could offer support in those areas. Um, okay. Other considerations include uh, applications that, that didn't quite fall under case management or safety net. So two applicants, uh, Trilogy, which offers individual and group counseling, and the Youth Job Center, which does offer um, job training and workforce development. Jessica, um, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna pause you. Your screen is black. And right. I was wondering if it was just me, but it is not just me. It is um, others as it's, well. Yeah, we got to get the slides up. So <laughs> I don't know what's happening. It says, oh, you started screen sharing, but it isn't showing up. I'm so sorry. Okay. Looked like I was sharing on my end. So thank, thank you. Let me try the again. The joys of Zoom. The joys of Zoom. Okay. So it says I'm, I'm sharing. Can people same see issue. my screen? Yeah, the same thing. The blank screen. Huh. That's weird. Still nothing? Oh. Okay. Well, I have to confess, I don't quite know how to. Sarah, do, do you think- Let you me see if I can share, because I've got, I've got it Thanks. open on, so. I will see if I can possibly do this. Um, I will just have to um, get to the correct place and um, get into slide mode and I can't 
see that at the moment. Hang on. Okay, now. Okay, so here's where we were. <laughs> Keep going. Next slide. One more. <laughs> All right. So, so these are uh, for the committee's consideration. Um, I, I mentioned two applications that didn't fit case management and safety net, um, but were identified as as referral partners. So it's trilogy for individual and group counseling and the youth job center for workforce development and job training. Um, impact behavioral health partners has received city funding uh, in the past and historically for their clinical services and support services. Um, Impact has been in conversation with the city since the beginning of um, discussions around the restructure. And the agency indicated uh, early on that they wanted to be considered, they they would like to apply for support services. Um, But we have not opened up that particular application process. So, so um, but, but we don't wanna leave them out. <laughs> and then there are two applicants who, who didn't fit case management or safety net, um, and they were Northwest CASA and Shore Community Services. So staff is working with all of these agencies to kind of quantify their services and, and sort of provide additional information. Um, but again, we're looking for direction from the committee uh, on, on how to proceed, how to proceed. Um, so that was was the the final component of this support services discussion. So, so sorry, I think you can stop sharing because the next slide is is the staff report, which happens later. Okay. On the... um, so, um... so now, while no, we are stopping sharing, to stop sharing there. Yeah, there we um, go. So. Um, just throwing out some possibilities. I mean, we all know, for example, that you know, mental health needs was the a number one thing that was identified. I, I mean, it's interesting because when you look at the the needs, you know, mental health challenges for everyone, especially the people who have the most difficult overall situation, is is huge. Um, job training or getting back in. Employed is obviously also a, a big one. Um, and so it's a question of, um, does the committee feel that we should focus on particular, these three, any combination, or um, is there anything that you think we're missing? You know, I mean, it's kind of like a, we'd really like your direction on what you feel is the, makes sense to approach from, you know, Yes. What should, what should be the focus of our efforts to get um, fee for service agreements based around uh, these support services? And this doesn't mean that this will be all that will ever happen. <laughs> Councilman Burns. Yeah. So you know, workforce development training um, is is likely going to be a, a key focus for uh, um, for our ARPA mm-hmm. allocations. Um, I, I'm sure even, you know, our response to, to, to mental health concerns and just the ongoing need for trauma informed therapy and counseling will also be a focus, but I know for sure, um, workforce development will be, which is why, you know, I'm, I'm leaning more towards, uh, benefits enrollment, uh, help with benefits enrollment and, um, and access to individual and group counseling and, so then the, the question becomes, you know, how do we get, how do we make the most impact with these funds? Uh, I've had conversations with uh, staff in our health department who feel like when we stretch our funds too thin between different organizations, we really don't get the best impact and, and that maybe we should focus on one area and direct those funds there so that we can um, uh, provide, you know, services for a larger group. Um, and uh, so those are just my first thoughts is, is, uh, is how, you know, how do we make the most impact with these funds? Oh, I think and this is the perfect time to do it because we have other funding, right? We have ARPA funding that can help in other areas, but what do we want to use these funds for? Um, yeah, so those are my first, first thoughts. Makes a lot of sense. 
Amanda. Yeah, I really, I really agree with the sentiment around not stretching too thin and really trying to think about what's going to be most impactful. And I'd sort of like to put a plug in for um, focusing on mental health services. Um, Yes, I am biased as a clinical social worker and things like that. But I do think, I mean, with the pandemic, I mean, demand and resources for mental health services were always exceeding what was available and it's mental health concerns are even more exacerbated with the pandemic and so I I do feel like it's really a critical area that um, you know that that can have a, a, a ripple effect you know if people are managing their mental health better they're able to function better in jobs they're motivated to do trainings to sign up for benefits all of those things. So I think, I feel like mental health is like a critical sort of first level foundational issue that I would love for us to focus on. Any other um, points of view that that folks wanna make sure that they um, voice here? And I just wanted to, I remember the the three, Jessica from your slides, But then the other provider also sort of didn't fit into those categories necessarily. So it was be it was mental health, um, workforce training, and then primary care. Um, But then there was that follow up slide where there was some other provider or agency. Sorry, Um, and I can't recall the types of services they provided. Sure, community services offers. supportive housing and and support to people with diagnosed um, developmental disabilities. And uh, Northwest CASA uh, provides counseling and advocacy for um, victims of sexual assault. And so, and both of those agencies previously received funding from the city? They have. Now, remember that one of the things we said up front was with this change, not everybody is necessarily going to be funded or funded for the same things even. There are some agencies that have applied differently, but um, they both applied. So we want to, you know, we agreed to sort of not consider them under case management and safety net, but so we didn't want to leave them hanging. We wanted to hear from the um, committee if you want us to pursue anything further with that. Um, um. I mean, in my mind, although perhaps I, 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 I'm familiar with Kassan's, you know, broadly speaking, and that I think their services probably fit into um, mental health and counseling services, um, given, you know, the trauma, you know, it's trauma recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm less familiar um, with the, the supportive housing for the um, developmentally disabled and the services that sort of the city was funding um, there. We can give you a little bit of background on what our funds have been used for. So they have um, housing and services associated with that to an extent, but there are sometimes that Shore doesn't provide some of the services. It can even be like how often um, some kind of extra caregiver might come in or something like that, so that they not, they aren't without services. It's that they would be better off if they had more. And so that's one of the challenges is when we move to a, we're trying to pe- get to the people who have the greatest needs and the least access to services. It's, it's a balancing act. And, and that's just, you know, um, so they, when we talked about, we wanna make sure that the people getting into case management have their basic needs covered so they can move forward. Um, you know, sure services clients don't, you know, can ultimately achieve, you know, independence. They're, they never will be able to achieve independence. It's, so they kind of don't fit that model either because, you know, they are people who will always need supports um, and, and that's, um, we acknowledge that it just, they don't fit into the 
and they can't the other challenges um, from a, a standpoint of, of taking on more clients, there's very little turnover. So again, it's not getting, and so I, that's the, that's the challenge. <laughs> Where and how do they fit? <laughs> Sorry, quick question. Uh, I don't know, I didn't see any, unless the Councilman Burns had a question. I know his hand. No, is no please okay. go, I'll go after you. Sorry, quick question. So I know we had talked about the funding last meeting, right? How much do we have for the support services? 178. And okay, and Let is me. it I'm sorry. Yeah. This is um remember that this is where we were putting one funding and mm -hmm. pretty soon we'll be moving into 2022. Um mm -hmm. Do you have that exact number, Jessica? I do, $178,912. And is it pretty much for these agencies that you put in the last slide over there or no? No, that's so for that supportive services. Service. It's for support services. So it's a question of is, does the committee want to do anything? I mean, do you think those services deserve consideration even though we're saying that they don't really completely fit anywhere is I guess what we're. Okay, and I guess at least just my two cents, I, I'm kind of like on the same page as Amanda. I feel like mental health does need to be addressed. So, um, you know, however we decide to do the funding. So these agencies that don't quite fit into case management and stuff, you know, at least, kind of give them consideration, however the funding gets decided. So, my two cents. Councilman Burns. Yeah, um, I guess one, and we're not, um, not to say we wouldn't go with one of these agencies, but we're not restricted to only looking at these agencies. We can, if we determine you know, individual group counseling with a, you know, uh, with a particular focus on mental health uh, treatment is the direction we want to go in. There are other agencies besides these that provide those services. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we would, we would be looking at, first of all, I think one of the things we would do is check with the agencies that are case management agencies say they refer to most of the time and figure out what what types of clients they would be able to take on and what the barriers are and see if we can work um, that out because that's kind of the first step. Um, and then, you know, Demita gave us a lot of very valuable perspective on people who are not um, necessarily fitting into going to those agencies or other places that take Medicaid or, 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 or they're looking for something that they can't get through um, the um, services that they can generally find, which is counselors or, or professionals in the, the mental health field who they feel comfortable going to, which is, you know, and, and as I say, I don't know how quickly we can address that, but I think it's something we really need to talk about because that is outside of the sort of traditional group that we fund. And one of the reasons we specifically said that the, the support services would be paid out of city local funds is that gives us greater flexibility to develop systems to accommodate those sorts of needs that we can't do with our federal funds, for example, because federal funds, we would have to go out and procure. And it's like, we'd have to say, we are looking for, you know, counselors who, you know, who's going to bid on this. It just isn't their method of not with CDBG anyway. It doesn't, it's not something that you could do. So I think we do want to try to get to looking at those sorts of needs. I think it's going to take, it's a little more complicated uh, and we need to probably talk more with some people and on this committee and stuff just offline to figure out how to go about it because it's, it would be a really much newer area. But I do think that it, those agencies that Jessica read that are the primary agencies that our case management clients are referring people to for 
um, mental health services like Trilogy, Turning Point Thresholds, uh, you know, are, are kind of a starting point for us. And we were simply pointing out that Trilogy had applied, but didn't really fit what they were doing was not really fitting either the safety net or case management, but they could be a, a fee for services or whatever you want to call it, safety net. Uh, excuse me, support services for mental health services. Um, and are there others? I, I'm sure there are. Um, we could certainly try to do a broader search, um, but that would be kind of our first starting point um, would be those agencies, the nonprofit agencies that are the sort of go-to. Um, it would be great actually if all of you professionals could even send us other ideas because, you know, Ultimately, we're going to need that, um, but we're not trying to limit it necessarily, and, and we don't know that all of them will be interested in working with us on this sort of thing. You know, it's kind of like very different from what how we funded any of them in the past, and, and we haven't directly funded some of them ever just because they haven't either applied or, um, you know, just it hasn't worked out that way. You know, it's uh, there are a number of Mental health agencies, um, the nonprofits sort of are regional. I mean, there's Turning Point in Skokie uh, and there's um, Jocelyn Center up in Northbrook. All of them serve people in this area. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe there would be a way to actually get some provider who would say that they can allocate a person who could come and work literally in Evanston someplace that would be more convenient for um, Evanston clients. I don't know. Uh, those are types of things that might be able to be worked out, especially if we are having some agencies making a lot of referrals to them. Um, I don't know, but that, that might not work because that would require clients to all be available on the same day or something like that. So, you know, so I think there's a lot of stuff that, that we need to, um, um, take a look at, but we don't want to restrict it to certain providers is, necessarily. Is there, but is there any way to model out what the need is? And I know that's always hard to 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 wrap oneself mm -hmm. around. But um you know one one place to start is just looking at um I don't necessarily want, want to say what what the agency is who the you know what who the agencies are turning away, but we need to get some sense of what the need is. I think the first place to start is with the agencies that are providing the service for Evanston residents, how many people are on their waiting lists? Um, how many people are they forced to turn away? But just to get a sense of what the need is, because where I'm stuck, always stuck at with this is, um, you know, with, with, I think we all are on the same page that we want to help with mental, um, with mental health treatment, but there's a few ways to back into that, or maybe two. There's, you can still get, get that, have that as an end result if you have, if you uh, have people helping people navigate the system, if that's the biggest barrier, right? Right. So we could hire people that can that can also do casework, but instead of providing the mental health you know, ther therapy directly, they would just be helping people sign up for Medicaid, helping them restructure their current coverage to to get it, et cetera, or any other way. And you you still can get the same end result if 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 that happens to be the biggest barrier versus okay, should we pay for the service directly? Um, and then even in there, it's like, do we, I'm always wanna look at, is it better to provide it in-house, right? As opposed to going with an agency that has other overhead that they're dealing with. And so those are the things that I'm thinking about, but understanding the need would help me personally be able to know which one of those routes makes the most sense. You know, what are we not, how much of the, the community that is actively looking for these services are we not covering right now and, and why? So we're not trying to cover all mental health services needs. Remember that the, these, these support services are supposed to be connected to people, individuals and households that are in case management. So I think that what we can do is try to quantify better by talking to the case management agencies that we've just funded, 
the need and maybe that will help provide that, that. That, yeah i agree that should make it even easier then if it's just people who are connected to the case management um organization agencies that we just funded that should make it even easier then. yeah right so Absolutely. why don't we start doing that <laughs> Actually, so we, we did, I have not um, presented that the information in this way because it is sort of a moving target, but when we had our sort of roundtable discussions with agencies, um, they did identify roughly approximate um, the number of participants uh, they worked with, and it was anywhere from one to 10, 10 to 30, you know, 30 to 50, 50 plus. Um, and again, it's a moving target as to the number of participants their case managers have engaged to need counseling, individual or group counseling at any time. Um, but I, I agree with you, Council Member Burns, we're you know looking forward to deeper conversations with case management agencies to, to better assess this. And I was careful to say model data because I think, again, it's a moving target. It's always hard to pin it, but if we can create a model just to work off of, Obviously, it won't be perfect, but it'll give us a better sense of how to think about this. And and even going a little deeper into, you know, um, uh, Demita wonderfully kind of broke down some of her some of her um, uh, some of the folks she's working with are, you know, once a week, some are monthly. Even knowing those kind of breakdowns would be helpful. You know, how many people are biweekly versus weekly versus monthly? Um, is that working? Um you know, all of that matters in terms of wrapping our head also around costs, because um, all those have a, a different cost um, associated with it because it's a different, you know, staff time associated with it. So I think the more we can wrap our head around that, the, the, the easier it will be for me personally to provide some, uh, some opinions or direction. I also want to thank Demita. I, I think this is an interesting idea. X amount of therapy sessions for individuals at an agency where their needs are met, regardless of where it is, uh, you know, I mean that that's another potential way of looking at at funding something if that can be um, getting to different agencies. Yeah, Agreed. and and our assumption isn't that the agencies or the providers will all be in Evanston. We just know that in some cases it's difficult for people to get to some places, you know, especially lower income people who frequently. And, and real quick, last thing for the in house. The reason why I always say in-house too, especially if it's because if we're just talking about people who are working with these providers, that's it might be a much smaller group than in everybody in the community that's right. looking. For. But the reason why I also talk about in-house is because um, it, also what I've heard in, in previous conversations is that we have a lack of therapists for our Spanish-speaking population, which is important, and so we could you know hire for that directly as opposed to hoping someone else has it, and and also trying to get. You know, we heard from Demita today about trying to get, um, you know, more African-American therapists, in particular African-American men. So all of these things we have much greater control over if, if we're thinking about bringing folks on as opposed to trying to find this, this out in the, um, from our agencies. And if we do end up going through agencies, I think we still need to make sure that they can provide, you know, um, that, you know, that they can address that, 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 that gap, you know, in, in service from Spanish uh, speaking um, therapists, also you know, African American and a diverse, racially diverse group of, of therapists. I think that's important. Important. I, I could not agree more, Councilman Burns. And, and to add a level of complexity, we hear often that um, Spanish speaking counselors for children and adolescents, um, even another level of finding them. Amanda, I believe you're next. Um, I was just going to just going to address one of the questions that um, uh, Mr. Burns had related to, you know, how many people are seen weekly or biweekly. And I think, you know, it, it really depends on the person, but the more risk that someone has, the more frequently they need to be seen. So, you know, knowing that mental health need is great and that uh, I would imagine that also would mean this is sort of nationally like risk is high. I mean, if we, the more frequently people can be seen, the better, but at the same time, people fit into different schedules all the time based on a variety of um, factors. So, but if someone has a really great need, they may not be in outpatient services. They may go to inpatient or um, intensive outpatient, or if they can be seen, you know, every other week or once a month, because that's what the agency can support based on their caseloads. Um, you know, I think sometimes in private practices, 
people can be seen more frequently because they do have control over their caseloads, as Demita was saying. But if you're at a larger agency, you may have hundreds of clients that you're seeing once a month or, or you know, even less frequently. And maybe that's not exactly what, you know, this, the person needs or could benefit most from, but that's sort of what's available. So I think if we can think about shortening those time spans, so like people could be seen every week or twice a month, you know, that's probably, I would imagine that that's what a lot of people would need, but it's going to vary on, you know, what people are presenting with and that kind of thing. That's very helpful. Um, and recognizing it's not just the need of the, the patient, but the capacity of the provider as well. And sort of, it's a lot of, a lot to balance. Jessica, at one point you had your hand raised, but all right. So then, and I apologize, Councilman Burns, your hand is, is it up from before or is it? Uh, yeah, let me put it, bring it down. No there worries, I just wanted to make sure I, I didn't miss it. So what I'm hearing from, from folks is a, a, a desire to focus on mental health, um, but I'm also hearing sort of potentially approaching it two different ways, both from direct services, either through an agency or potentially hiring um, at the city level, but also a recognition that navigating the healthcare benefits, whether it be through the exchange or through Medicaid, and honestly, in Medicare as well, is quite complicated. And, and potentially one avenue of resource could be an entity or, or a, a, those that application process and that enrollment process. Um, and I just, sorry, uh, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So quick question, doesn't case management help with that? That was my thing, I was, you know, we have the case management services. Is that not what they help their clients with, with the whole navigation process? Yes, they do. And I think they will, they do for the people that are in case management, absolutely. I think um, council member Burns may have been thinking more broadly. And, you know, one of the things that we were certainly trying to encourage in our discussions with providers about the whole system is we said there might be something like somebody who simply does benefits enrollment and stuff. Nobody applied under that. Um, so that's something I think we might want to continue to seek, but I don't know that we ought to add it as a component right now. I mean, we are going to, you know, I, I honestly, Jessica and I recommend that we don't do a whole new application round for 2022 because we've barely gotten off the ground. And I think that what we need to do is assess how our agencies are doing um, by second quarter, sometime in the second quarter, and then make a decision of, you know, continuing with some, you know, adjusting and things like that, and maybe identifying things that we may want to look for that we don't have funded. But one of our challenges is that I think would be beneficial if we don't do that until we get an idea of what our CDBG funding is. We don't really know what we got, you know, how we should, what we're working with. So, um, uh, so I think that um, that might be something we should look at as we get kind of to a next step. I, I think that if we were to do that, um, I don't know how we would find navigators unless we went out to sort of through an RFP process or we hired somebody or asked somebody to hire somebody. So I'm not quite sure how to approach that given the way we normally, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And there, yeah, there are agencies, um, or providers who've previously served as navigators that are probably well positioned to sort of, um, if there were funding, I mean, you could potentially pick that back up. And, and then the one thing I just wanna revisit again, I, I guess um, I, I very much agree with the focus on mental health, um, but I, I do, um, I, I do worry of sort of how, especially CASA sort of sitting out there um, without um, 
without support um, and just the record, I, I have, I'm a little concerned. I, I do sort of see their services fitting under that mental health umbrella, um, but I, I just wanted to sort of raise that, uh, you know, for victims of sexual assault. Amanda, is that actually right? Okay, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody in your I was like, oh, let me just raise my hand. That might just be faster. Um, I seem to remember that they do offer counseling because the yeah. person, the representative that came talked about how they have a long waiting list also at times and the other agencies that they refer to. So I could see them, you know, pretty easily fitting into, um, you know, this paradigm or what have you, so. Yep, they, they very much provide uh, mental health services for helping individuals recover from trauma. Councilman Burns. I just wanted to say that that just to go back on the on the uh, navigating the system part is just that we as all as taxpayers put a lot of money into Medicaid. And and so with local governments, we always always have an issue with funding. You know, we don't have the same. We're not funded at the same levels as state and federal, et cetera. So. Um, unless it's the system is just completely bankrupt and there's nothing to get out of it. It's like it's stretched to its full capacity and it's 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 not worth the half of, of trying to work with it anymore. Then I think we're, we I just don't want to lose any money, leave any money on the table. Like we, you know, that is a program that that, that we all fund uh, as, as taxpayers. And so if there's a way to connect people with services through Medicaid as opposed to paying for it as a small local government. I think we should we should always do that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think the reason going back to why it's important to see what the need is, is because, uh, you know, even if we fund a cost or someone else, if they don't have the capacity to take in, you know, new community members, then we're right back in the same, same problem. Whereas if we know what the number is, again, we might be able to build a new program maybe with some partner agencies to serve that need as opposed to trying to fit it into an agency that's already um at capacity which i would imagine most are right now so uh, i just wanted to underscore the point that i think understanding having a sense of of what the current need is um is is important i i could not agree more, Councilman Burns, and, and a recognition also, um, one piece that we haven't added or, or haven't discussed um, as, as fully is that, you know, we're focusing a lot on Medicaid with that 138% and below, but also um, for those individuals, 138% and above um, who've purchased on the exchange, they're because of ARPA and then now, um, well, potentially um, further investment um, at the federal level, increased um, subsidies and decreased sort of cost sharing, th there could be a real, there is a real opportunity, I think, to help individuals navigate the healthcare um, benefit industry because it, it's quite complicated and it's now really different than it was even two years ago in terms of, you know, the, in terms of the cost from a patient perspective. And so I do think you're right that there's a lot there. The idea and the hope is always that case management does that work. Um, that 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 would be the goal. But I, but whether or not you know that it, we're all we're achieving that necessarily in a broad perspective or just for that small group of people, um, I think is where there. That's where the real opportunity is, and I think that's what you're pointing out, Councilman Burns, is that that's where you're going to have potentially a larger bang for your buck, if you will. And, and, and hopefully long term coverage. Right? Like right. Working with one of these agencies and the way we're, we're thinking about now, if we run out of funding. Then what? Right. Where are we leaving our community members? And so I, I really want to set people up for long term coverage because um, they'll need it, you know, and not because we, we all need it to, to a certain degree that to have that consistent support and um, and, uh, you know, ongoing counseling and someone to talk to and work through. Your, 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 your life with. I think all of that is something that probably should happen for the rest of someone's life if they are interested in that. So how, how do we provide people long-term coverage? I think it is more likely to go through an insurance process as opposed to kind of these one-off, okay, we can pay up to this amount and then you're on your own again. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that. 
and, and comprehensive coverage as well, not just one benefit, but but full coverage. Right. All right. So Amanda, I think you are also, actually, I can't even recall. I'm so sorry. Um, I cannot recall where, uh, where we had left off and sort of next steps. Thank you, Jessica. To borrow from Amanda, trying to unmute and figuring out how to raise my hand is challenging. So maybe this will help. Um, of the, uh, between Northwest CASA Trilogy, Youth Job Center and Shore Community Services, those combined applications um, represent an ask of $120,800. Um, we do have, uh, if you guys can bear with me flipping. I apologize. 178,912 to allocate. And I have not done the math to know what the difference is. Um, but, and I hear, um, Chair, your concern about the agencies, Northwest CASA and the other agencies who are sort of waiting in the wings for, for lack of a better term. Um, staff is in communication with these agencies to quantify the number served and the hours of service provided. Um, Northwest CASA does offer advocacy services and counseling services. Um, so this com staff can come back to the committee with um, more sort of concrete numbers um, once, once we have sort of the time to work with our agencies around that, if that would better inform the decision, does that is that helpful? Yes, I mean, if you feel, Jessica, like there's time for that. I mean, I, I recognize we're in you know November, and I, I want to make sure we're also cognizant of the um, you know the end of the year. But I, these are local funds as well. That's the local funds, fortunately, we can carry over into <laughs> 2022. But I think one of the um, challenges is we have been trying to figure out how with Northwest Costa, I mean, again, we're trying to, we've said we're not funding everything. Um, and so they are the, the ability to connect funding them as a safety net service to getting more clients into or more Evanston people served was not possible because it really is who presents with that need. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's yes. kind of a, it, it's, you know, it, it's a safety net service, but they serve a very broad area and our um, historical numbers, even when we funded them in past years of their anticipated numbers of Evanston clients versus the actual numbers of Evanston clients, um, got out of proportion to, from a staff standpoint, to the number of people we were serving. And that was something we'd been discussing with them. They've also gone through a transition. Their long time, long time executive direct, director left sometime in 2020, I don't remember quite when, and there is a, they have a new director who's really working with us. We're just trying to understand, you know, but, you know, we're not really clear on how our funding increases the service to Evanston residents. They are mandated as the advocacy contacts for our two, they have memoranda of understanding with our two hospitals. And one of the things we have found from discussion with our um, our advocates is there is sometimes confusion between who is advocating, you know, because if say somebody comes who is a victim comes to the police first and is connected or, or some of them actually have connected with our advocates and then they're already working with them. 
it, it's it's a complicated thing to figure out, as I say, what what our funding does to expand their capacity to serve Evanston residents. It expands their capacity, but does it result in expanded service to Evanston is, is a question that we haven't been able to answer. Is that a fair way of putting it, Jessica? Yeah, well, I, I think the missing component is that, that the city's Health and Human Services Department has victim advocates on staff who don't only work with sexual assault um, survivors, they work with sort of victims of all crimes, um, but, but sexual assault does fall in that purview. So one of our, one of the things that we're exploring is um, how those services overlap. And has there been a discussion further on the, on the counseling component? There, there are discussions <laughs> happening. Not resolved yet. I mean, right. what, what we haven't been able to, apparently at, at some point, maybe eight years ago or something, there was a, there was a shift in this, in these, to these memoranda of understanding um, for who was responsible for what. So there are agencies that have a limited understanding of this because it's pretty new, it basically cover an area and they have memoranda of understanding with the hospitals. So they are supposed to be, but uh, the, the advocates there, but what we used to have from, according to one of our advocates who's been working for a long time is they used to be able to refer people that they started working with for the counseling. And that link seems to be broken right now. Okay. And we're trying to work on if it can be reestablished. And we actually had Ike Ogbo, who is the director, our, you know, director of health and human services and uh, one of the advocates in a discussion. So perhaps we should continue to explore that and bring you back more information as we have it. That, because that we agree that the counseling services very much fit into what we are trying to prioritize for funding, but we haven't figured out how we can get people to access that directly as a referral from even our um, Your advocates. Own. Okay. Right now. Wonderful. So we'll keep Perfect. working on that. That would be great. Any further? Oh, go right ahead, Jessica. Sorry. Uh, um, would the committee want to entertain a discussion of, of perhaps exploring partnerships with other mental health providers in the community who um, were recognized by partners as, as providers? So um, I'm sorry, I'm flipping through my notes, but I, I am um, thinking of they were identified. I apologize in the memo. Um, trilogy, thresholds. Um, here we go. Turning point. Uh, the Family Institute at Northwestern. Um, if the focus was mental health, um, or would the focus? I, I heard a lot of support for mental health, um, but I don't know if, if that means that that the we're not focusing on workforce development because as council member Burns pointed out, perhaps in the immediate um, future, there is other uh, funding available for workforce development. I'm seeing that that has pretty broad support in the chat. Thank you <laughs> for those of you who are putting that in the chat. Um, is that so we'll take that. I, I mean, I don't think we necessarily want to have a vote on this, this is really input, but but um, we can take that and start talking to these agencies and you know see what we can work out and, and looking at those, um, I would think particularly the people who are being referred or, or looking for services, but don't, don't fit Medicaid, especially, um, and then also talking to them of what, what could we do to help them get Medicaid people into services more quickly if it's, you know, would be the approach. Does that make, does that sound like a good starting point? 
<laughs> yeah, and what I was gonna say really quickly is that is some of this doesn't even have to be that challenging. If we have waiting lists, you know, if these agencies have waiting lists and then they're having some residents, if that's what we're only on, just call them and just be like, hey, I mean, that's case management, right? You know, hey, you know, we're working on something with the city. Um, you know, we we want to figure out if the barrier is: do you not have Medicaid? Are you not eligible for it? Are you earning too much? Um, do you have you know insurance coverage current? You know. Uh, insurance coverage? Does it cover, uh, you know, uh, counseling? Does it not? Why? You know, could it, you know, just this information is out there if we just ask for it. And not that you would have to, to, to track all that information down, but if the agencies are willing to do it, we can really have a, a good look at, um, you know, where, what, where the needs are, what the barriers are, and then craft a program or a funding um, opportunity that addresses that need directly, as opposed to just trying to guess what it is let's let's ask you know oh we will ask them yeah yeah we will absolutely ask them but again and remember, i'm still we're not the agencies to... ask the people on the wait list let's be clear because we're talking about people in the way you described it earlier just work with me real quick the way you described it earlier is that the so the support services that we're talking about are exclusively for clients if i can call them that of agencies that we're already funding, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I would imagine that those agencies have wait lists for uh, individual and group counseling, correct? So I'm saying they can yes. call through those wait lists to ask the, right, to ask the people, what is, what is to figure out what the barriers are, what the challenges are, and they can come back to us with that information so that we can craft something that addresses sure. that immediate I see what need. you're saying, for people who are already yeah. in the queue, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. That's a really good suggestion. Yeah. But then it's also how can we create something that will be when to keep people from getting to the bottom of the queue of our new case management people. <laughs> so it's a combination. I think, and I think what we'll find is it's, there's probably some similarities as it flows. You, you'll we'll see some similarities that the same percentage of people who are coming for it now will come for it later, um, you know, are don't have any coverage or aren't eligible for, I mean, we'll, we'll probably see that there'll be a pattern that develops and that's right. what we're trying to find. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Absolutely. It helps if I unmute any further discussion before we move to the next agenda item. And Jessica and Sarah, do you feel like you have enough to sort of for next steps? Or do you need to clarify there are any? Oh, I, I think we do. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I'm hearing that the focus is going to be mental health services, individual counseling, group counseling, whatever that is, actually. And then the really trying to figure out the barriers to getting people who may all our agencies, our case management agencies, clients who may already be in the queue of any of the mental health providers, what can we do to move them up in the queue and get them out of the queue and get them into services and then try to quantify the needs for new clients or new case management clients who would be being referred, how can we get them services, whether it's working with those agencies, expanding to other agencies, you know, really quantifying, maybe our first step could be coming back with how many are in queue, how can we address those and then how we could move forward from there. I think we'll, we'll, we'll get to work on this and um, we'll have a report for you. <laughs> you know, one of the things is we've described this service plan. In fact, you know, the, the case management and then the support services to a number of people, including we had some discussion with um, our uh, HUD representative who was monitoring us for emergency solutions grant, which is, you know, for the homeless, and they were talking about all the needs, and she had worked in, in the field for a long time, so we would get off on, you know, what people need and how you can get it, and she said, that's really interesting because nothing is ever connected, so we want to know how you work it out, and we said, okay, we're going to work on it, we'll see if we can do it, but one of the challenges of funding is so much of it is you can do only this one little thing and it goes to different organizations and there's no way to coordinate it. So uh, what we're hearing is you're trying something that we think is really bold and could be wonderful. Please tell us if you can get it to work. <laughs> so we're trying. 
<laughs> um, and it's wonderful to have a committee with so many and mental health professionals who can give us the kind of perspective that you are giving us now, because uh, you know it is it is a little bit daunting, but we'll I think we've got a path forward, and um, you know um, we will be able to report to you on how how much we've accomplished. <laughs> and I think I, I actually appreciate focusing on one need because I think we can do a much better job of looking at mental health needs than trying to um, uh, look at all the needs. And so we greatly appreciate that. Okay. And then the next item I have on the agenda is 2022 funding updates. I think we probably touched on that a little bit. Um, um, or did I have the wrong item? Yeah. Oh. I apologize. That got moved to December. Got it. Apologize. I wonder if I have the wrong one open. I think I do. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> I have the. Then I just have the meeting dates, correct? Right. The meeting dates, we officially need you all to say, yes, oh, look, these are the standing meeting dates. <laughs> and we approve the schedule. <laughs> we will put them in the calendar. So do I need a motion? Where are, they? Oh. Uh, where, are they? where are they? I'm sorry, I don't see. Um, they are in the packet, and we can put them up onto the screen if we can. Let me get my screen sharing open again. Is there a reason? Oh, sorry, Chair. Yes. I apologize. Yes, no problem. Uh, I uh, is there a reason we, we made it seven as opposed to six? It's fairly late in the evening to get started. You know, the reason is simply that those were the standing committee schedules that they have been that way for years. Um, when we were in person, because we had difficulty getting people to come at six. I don't believe there's any reason the committee couldn't vote to change its time, at, especially if it works best for people while we're virtual. I mean, those are flexibilities that the committee can have, and we would just put it on the calendar. And I personally don't have any attachment to seven o'clock versus six. It was just, you know, the standing committees were set and we just took over the standing committee time for what was the mental health board schedule. So. Is anyone else uh, opposed to moving it up to six? I just think that would uh, you know, not put us so uh, late in the evening uh, wrapping up the meeting. Council, Eric, Reed, I, I agree with. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say I agree with uh, six as long as we're if we're operating in a virtual environment and it's fine for everybody. But I think once once uh, more and more people start to go back to the office and need to eventually start to make their way back to be able to attend these meetings, six is going to be a lot harder. So if if we're going to change now and then have to change back again, that's just one thing I want to make sure we consider. I think that's why seven works for me is is I'm able to do some of my elected official duties, do some work, get stuff situated with the kids and then hop on. So, I mean, seven is, uh, works for me. I'm flexible though, but seven works for me. Yeah, I, I will say six, uh, seven is a following Councilman Burns, same, same thing for me of getting work done, kids settled, meeting. Um, virtually six is fine, in person six becomes a real challenge. <laughs> Amanda, seven works for you. And Archna. Seven works for me. And like most people say, six is good if we're doing virtual. Does six not work for anybody in a virtual setting? 
For me, it kind of depends because today I was able to leave work early, but there'll be times when I'm leaving work at five, so I might not make it in time. But I mean, you know, I don't have to be there for every meeting. I can log in later. Oh, but I we can like, log in later. But we like having you. What about oh, sure. 30? Yeah. I mean, six is fine. We can do six. I'll just like log on from my phone or something if I'm running late or try to leave early that one day of the month. 6.30 is good if we're going to shift it. That, you know, that 30 minutes sure. can make all the difference. Sure. All right. We will. Why don't we? Sh- a big compromise. <laughs> yes. We could certainly switch the December meeting to 6.30 and then, you know, wait uh, and, and not necessarily change uh, i think maybe to change as we go because we don't know quite how long we'll still be virtual does that make sense um i want to be able to do it for the committee's convenience um but if we as you say if we change them all and then we change back it's kind of like i, I don't know um it doesn't make that much difference other than we put it on the calendar and people hopefully will look at the calendar and see if it changes but you know <laughs> i don't know Jessica is very good about sending reminders. Well, we can certainly for the committee. It's just the the public the sometimes. Members, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. And that is, a, I think, a thing. People, and again, I'm happy to go six thirty, but I, I think that is a thing where community members, you know, they know. All right, this committee meets around this time on this, you know, these days on this time. So. Um, that is something to think about, but um, prerogative of the board. Does anybody disagree with 630 for December? Do we need a motion on times? Jessica's saying yes, so I need a motion. We probably for should just for safety. Because <laughs> then we can say, but it was voted on and approved. <laughs> um, can I get a motion for 630 for the December meeting? Motion for 630 for the Thank December you, meeting. Derek. Uh, a second. Second. Thank second. you. And a roll call. Uh, Aye. Derek. Aye. Samantha. Aye. 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 I'm not hearing, but I, if I'm getting called. Yeah, I can't hear anything either. I couldn't, I, I can't hear you, Jessica. Okay, is this better? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. Maybe I was just quiet. Sorry. Uh, Council member Burns. Uh, aye. Great. Council member Reed. Aye. And Danita Cravens. Oh, her. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. And so then at this point, should we approve the time or the dates and the times for 2022 with and adjust the time as we go should we need to that makes sense mm-hmm. all right and the Let's be clear the no meeting in december Oh no, we have a meeting in December, but we we okay. approved that before. It's just okay. we approved the, the the this year's calendar. We're just approving the calendar dates okay. for 2022. Oh right, right, right. Okay. Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. When is the December meeting again? December 9th at six thirty. Thank you. Yes, I had to check my calendar for the date. <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion to approve the dates for 2022? Any discussion on the dates? Motion to approve. approval. Sorry, go. I got a motion. Um, I'll I'll second it. Second. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And then a roll call, please. Uh, 
I can't hear you, Jessica. Here, I tell you what, I, I'll do that because Jessica's muted. So we got Arch and I said, yes, Derek. Hi. Thank you. Samantha. Yes. Thank you, Amanda. Hi. Thank you, Council Member Burns. Aye. Thank you, Council Member Reed. Aye. And Demita. Aye. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then the only other item I think is it's just adjourning. Is that correct? Or no, it, sorry. Yes, it's just adjourning and I see no further business. So I do not need a motion. Correct. Right. correct. We can just Thank adjourn. <laughs> all right. Well, I will adjourn this meeting. I look forward to seeing you all on December 9th at 630. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.